Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, the evolution of the music is a remarkable thing, and if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals, and we pick their brain about uh, current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And, you know, if you like how we do things, I'm, I'm guessing you do, because you're here, you're listening, uh, you can subscribe to the podcast. You can find us over at Amazon. Uh, Apple, Spotify, Google, it's all good. Basically, wherever you get your podcasts. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In The Seats YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we would really appreciate it. Uh, you can also check us out on social media. Find us over at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at either at In The Seats or at its podcast one. And finally... And I, I repeat this a lot, but it's true. It's it's where it all began. Please visit us over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest in the world of film, television, the moving image in general, because we love to write about it and talk about it, and we love it when you come and read about it. On this episode, we got an interesting one. Um, it hit uh, the Apple Plus service this last Friday, uh, it's a documentary by the one and only Mr. Todd Haynes about the Velvet Underground. Lou Reed, Nico, the whole nine yards. We get a real sort of fascinating and visually engaging look at sort of not just the formation of the band, but uh, their legacy and just sort of what they meant to music and what they meant in pop culture at the time. And uh, we got the distinct chance of sitting down and talking with cinematographer Ed Lashman, uh, who does a fantastic job really giving this film a very unique visual style. And, I mean, you wouldn't think that sort of the job of a cinematographer is all that big on a on a documentary, but it's, it's vital here. The work he does with Todd Haynes really sort of puts us in, a, in the mood of the time and, and really allows us to sort of understand the pop cultural significance of a band like The Velvet Underground and Lou Reed and what they did, not just in the moment, but how uh, how their music has been a real big influence uh, on the world of music, art, and everything else in between. It was a it was a fascinating time that we got to look at as this as this band came out of New York, and it's a fantastic film on the Apple Plus streaming service, which I cannot highly recommend enough. But uh, the one thing I can only highly recommend more is our talk with ed because uh it was a real interesting one so i hope you enjoy now i mean obviously first off thank you so much for the time and congratulations on the film i really loved it oh wonderful now i mean i will admit as someone who knew of the velvet underground but not really about them i was kind of enthralled by it and i loved sort of the aesthetic of the film can i guess because you've worked with todd a lot can you talk me through just sort of how todd approached you about doing the film and kind of how you wanted the film to look well, look, there was an evolution. You know, part of the problem was there wasn't a lot of footage of the Velvet Underground in performance. And, you know, so he had to piecemeal things together. But that gave the strength to it because he then could rely on um, the cultural movement of the time, you know, mm -hmm. the independent filmmakers, you know, like the Jonas Mikas and the, this experimentation of how rich New York was at the time. And then Andy Warhol, who became the empresario of the group, was, uh, you know, the, the premier pop artist of the time, you know, like with also Roy Lichtenstein. And so this gave, and you see all of Todd's films, he's, you know, he knows, he studied semiology. He's always interested in every film I've ever worked on, the, the, the cultural context of why those images get created the way they do. It isn't just a reference, oh, that looks cool. Mm. So this allowed him to play with uh, kind of the gestalt, the, the, the feeling of what those images represented and how they were so integral to telling the story of who the Velvet Underground was, because they were like an art movement in themselves. For sure. And um, 
my my part was you know how to shoot these interviews and he made a decision that he would only shoot people that had personal contact with the velvet from when they were formed in 63 to when their demise of the early 70s 73 74 so the references became obvious like the way andy shot those screen tests he mm. called them screen tests but they were kind of like still portraits in 16 millimeter you know where you would have someone in front of his camera with one light source right black and white kind of a brutal look at people you know un uncovering the veneer of them and just having them look into the camera so that for me was and for todd a reference and then the other thing was the andy warhol silk screens you know the what he did to uh encompass you know the media idea of you know everyone's famous for 15 seconds and he did these silk screens with like Marilyn Monroe and Jackie Onassis and Debbie Harry and and the, the these color they, they were like flat color palette of different images well one image but they were like pencil drawings in a litho a lithography with so I we use that as the color palette as backgrounds for the interviews, but then also I implemented their faces in a color that was close to the background. Mm. So I was like, you know, flatting, flatting out the image of them to make them feel like they were, could be a Warhol silkscreen. So that, that, that was my, and then the other aspect of it was, I knew that Todd was interested to do these multifaceted, um, frames of multiple images kind of like warhol's chelsea girls and uh so i did framing that i knew could work in quadrants in different parts of the so it's in just photographing one person that would fill the whole screen that uh, you you could cut out the frame and use that part for that person in the frame Excellent. I mean, it, it really creates this very sort of immersive world that we're getting sort of jumped into. And I mean, this might be a silly question, but I'm always kind of curious. Obviously, as a cinematographer who's worked on features and worked on documentaries, how does the job change for you when you're going into something that's a documentary? And you're working with a lot of archival footage as well. Yeah. You know, I started in documentary, actually. You know, I started with the Maisel Brothers, who did yeah. Give Shelter and Sales with it. And I always say in a funny way, all films are documentaries. They're documenting something. Right. Never, even in a narrative film, the performance is never exactly the same. The camera movement isn't exactly the same. Where the actor ends up in the light isn't exactly the same. So for me, they're always documents. And that's actually the way I like to shoot narrative films anyway. I, I've worked with people like Ulrich Seidel, an Austrian director. I've worked with a lot of filmmakers, including myself. I did a film, Ten Park, with Larry Clark, where I'm working off of reality. I'm working off of the authenticity of the time. And so I, I don't make a distinction, you know? And I think what was so interesting, what Todd, this was, Todd's foray into a documentary form. And this came up in a uh, Q&A at uh, Lincoln Center, was in his fictional films, he's always so specific in details that he's researched to create the authenticity of the time period. You know, like we worked with Mildred Pierce in the 30s and 40s, or the Dylan film, I'm not there in the 60s, or uh, Carol in the 50s, or uh, Far From Heaven in a different time in the 50s, that it builds the credibility of the performances in the story. 
where in the documentary form in this film, he had to rely on fictional ideas to create the world of what there was because he didn't have a lot of actual footage of the Velvet Underground. So by situating them culturally in the art world, in the experimental film world, he creates the kind of the gestalt, the, the, the feeling of you were living there at the time, this is how you would feel. So I think that's what is similar and different that he was able to fictionalize a story. No, I don't use the word fictional, I shouldn't use. Um, he created this palette, you mm. know, of a world, you know, that um, what he created an experimental film to talk about how experimental the Velvet Underground was, how what Andy Warhol's influence was on the group and how they fit in the culture of the time. For sure. No, I mean, I love that because, I mean, in watching it, it felt, it felt like I was just out of time. Like I was just, I was watching this experience sort of that was in and of itself. And I mean, even you mentioned some of your previous work and even something like Dark Waters, which was just out of time to really sort of create this bubble of, sort of this moment that you're watching. And I'm kind of curious from your perspective, how important is it to have a collaborator like Todd, where obviously you've probably developed a bit of a second hand at this stage because you've worked so often together to be able to create something unique like you have with this film? Uh, for me, it's like always going back to film school. I mean, Todd is so rich in his references. And the thing about Todd is, it isn't just like, oh, I want to make it look like a Douglas Sirk film, but he actually understands and wants to understand how those images were created. So let's say um, Wonderstruck, um, which was two time periods, the 20s and the 70s. Right. Obviously, the quintessential film in the 70s in New York, you know, the grit was the French Connection. For sure. So he said, how did they do those dolly shots across the street? You know, you have traffic coming at you. And, you know, so I, Owen Rosman is still alive, the cinematographer that worked with Billy Freakin. So I called up Owen. I said, how did you do those shots? He was on a crane arm, you know, so you wouldn't have tractors. Because, no, man, we had to do it on a Western dolly. A Western dolly is like a rubber wheels on a plywood platform that basically today we use to carry equipment around. You would never put a camera on. They would just pull it. It was like a wagon. They would pull it across the street because there was no track, you know, you, not something to put the camera on that you had to, you know, pull it. So that's Todd. I went back to the crew, the my grips and said, well, we want to use the West. They go, are you crazy? You know how hard that's going to be when we'll never get it in the right position and it's going to be bouncy and you know blah 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 no and that's the way todd wants to do it and sure enough when you look at those images you feel like you're looking at images out of the 70s and people said the film looks like and there were other aspects of that film i i found out many of the studios were using a cheaper way of making prints. They had to make hundreds of prints. So they would shoot it on Kodak stock and then they would use Fuji stock for the printing. And when they did that, the color shifted, you know, not to get involved, but they went magenta green, you know. So I created that in my lighting and it absolutely feels like those images were like just taken out of a 70s film in kind of the movement and the color rendition. So that, that's what's so interesting for me about Todd is he, the research he does, but also understanding the means of how those images are created in that period that creates the look of the film. No, and I mean, it really does add to it because, I mean, it's almost like you're making something out of 
something that doesn't exist anymore, something about something that what was. And I mean, for a film like this, where, like you said, you don't have footage of the Velvet Underground, you have to sort of create sort of an aesthetic and make create a feeling. And I think you guys have done that with this film. And I just want to say thank you for the work and thank you for the time today. Yeah, thank you. Well, right. it, it all goes to Todd, you know, I was a, <laughs> small, a small piece of the frame. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Ed. Thank you. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.